Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this uh, webinar that's been hosted by AHDB Beef and Lamb. My name's Amy Forster. I'm the Knowledge Exchange Manager for the Midlands. We're delighted to welcome Max Tweedy this evening. Um, Max is the National Beef Genetics Manager for Beef and Lamb Genetics in New Zealand. And his presentation this evening is going to be on the beef progeny testing program that he manages, the results from that program, and how the farmers in New Zealand uh, are using the information to shape their breeding programs. So the plan of action this evening is that Max will run through his presentation and there'll be time for questions at the end. You guys will all stay muted throughout, but if you have got any questions as we go through, you can type them into the box on the right hand side of your screen where it says questions. So we've got over 100 people registered this evening for the webinar. I'd just like to thank Chloe in the background who's keeping everything uh, working smoothly, hopefully. Um, we shouldn't have any technical problems, but if we do, just bear with us. We'll obviously try to keep these to a minimum. Okay, so without further delay, I will pass over to Matt. Yeah, good day, and uh, thanks for having me, Amy, and AHDB. Uh, it's cool to be able to be over in the UK and talk about the things that we're, um, we're passionate about and, and a bit about what we're doing and what we've learnt in New Zealand. Um, I'm from a company called Beef and Lamb New Zealand Genetics. Um, we are a subsidiary company of our, our national levy uh, organisation. So when people kill their sheep and cattle, um, they pay a fee and uh, that money goes to all sorts of things. But um, in this instance, it goes towards Beef and Lamb Genetics and you know we're an information infrastructure company. So we provide tools to help people make profitable breeding decisions. Um, we don't buy uh, or sell breed rams and bulls, we just pro help provide the service. So that's things like progeny testing and, and the like. Um, we're funded by levies, but also some money from government and some third party stuff as well. Um, uh, currently our, our program encompasses um, all sorts of sheep stuff, uh, including SIL, which is the New Zealand Sheep Genetic Evaluation. Um, but most importantly, what we do is beef genetics. Um, and that's where I uh, come, come into things. Um, we progeny test, so we use lots of bulls uh, over dairy uh, cows and beef cows. And we also have some other projects with our mates in Aussie. Um, and when we uh, look at uh, different factors like maternal cow performance. Uh, who am I? I'm, um, I'm from a um, small area in um, in New Zealand and uh, known as Hawke's Bay uh, on the east coast you'll see that we yellow star um, on on the map over on the right there uh, come from a um, from a commercial farm but I've got a business uh, that I run on my parents farm um, breeding um, Angus bulls uh, and also um, of course have this have this role managing our beef genetics research program um, our uh, New Zealand um, beef industry, probably a few things uh, to lay out and to let you know about um, that might give a wee bit of context. So uh, over the last uh, 10 to 15 years, New Zealand um, beef farmers have been marginalised. Um, by that I mean we've been pushed into the steeper country, uh, into the stuff that, uh, into the area uh, of land that is um, less desirable because um, dairy farming has been more profitable. And when something is more profitable, typically that land changes use and in this, in New Zealand's case, it's been, it's been dairy farming. So all the good flat land is, has been converted. Uh, we're now at a point where that boom is on is trailing off, and so we're actually having sheep and beef farms that are going back, um, and back into sheep and beef. So that's always always interesting. Um, beef cattle are and cows are nearly always run with sheep um, in in New Zealand. That's pretty typical. Uh, most of our um, our situations are outside. There's no housing, and there's very little uh, grain feeding or supplement. Uh, grain at, at any time of the year with, with cattle um, and that's mostly rotational grazing so moving around paddocks um, and, re and regular shifting. A lot of people have gone away from beef cows because they've been less profitable um, and and have gone on to finishing cattle uh, where they can, obviously environment um, dependent um, and, and that's largely been driven by the fact that we've got a heap of surplus of, um, of dairy beef calves from the dairy industry and ultimately the decisions the uh, bull selections and the like, uh, genetic gain is determined by New Zealand beef breeders. Um, there aren't other big corporate companies that are, that are part of that, it's the breeders that make the genetic gain, so it's in the farmer's hands. Um, and so we set about um, uh, to, to establish the beef progeny test and it came about as a result of sort of four major questions. Um, and the first one was, what is the right type of cow for New Zealand hill country? 
and this is a, a question that's often at, at the um, uh, front of mind for a lot of um, you know beef breeders, and that is you know how what does that cow look like, and how do we describe her? Is it an 800 kilo cow winning a, a whopping big calf, or is it a 600 kilo cow winning a, a, a smaller calf? Is it that cow that holds condition year round, um, or is it that cow that loses a large amount of body weight in the winter outside New Zealand and then picks it up, lifts and and, and gets in calf early in the in the season? Um, all of these things and the different ways those cows are characterised are contentious, and so we set about to um, describe what is the right type of cow for hill country. The second one um, issue being is what sort of cattle are required to hit uh, market specs. We've got a developing, emerging market um, where uh, eating quality is paid for, uh, where cattle are, are graded in the chiller um, after, um, after slaughter, and that um, determines things like marbling and, and, and the like. And so what are the sort of cattle that are going to hit those programs and, and do it well? Can we have both? Can we balance that right type of how, a cow that we've described and to have excellent cattle that, uh, that, that eat well? Is that possible? And fourth, do we have the tools um, to make sure we can um, achieve these things? So that were the, that were the questions. And um, as a result, we established the beef progeny test. And the beef progeny test has three objectives. The first one is to quantify the value of, of investment in better genetics. So if you do pay more for a bull and he's got better EBVs, do you get your bang for your buck? Um, and, and quantify if we do spend the money, what's the result? To demonstrate the tools, to show best use of, of um, tools like AI, um, uh, using breeding values and, and, and technologies like that, um, show the best best use of those tools. And the third one is being to improve the toolkit. So um, let's just, if we're going to describe the cow, let's, let's make that into, um, into uh, tools we can use for selection. Uh, and, but most importantly, do it on New Zealand commercial beef farms. So do it on places where cattle are usually run and not in um, stud herds that are well fed or research um, herds, situations like that, but do it out where cattle and cows are run in New Zealand. And so these things and these things of these objectives are always at front of mind when we're doing any work within the beef progeny test. So we're doing 50 bulls a year um, and we're doing that at the moment on five properties. Um, and, you know, in our selections of bulls, we'll have anything from yearling size, so young bulls with not a lot of information and low accuracy, anything up to older proven size. So some of our older bulls are up to 12 years old. Um, that are being used widely and have many calves. Um, and, you know, we're doing this at the moment across 11 breeds. Um, and and so, you know, dominantly we're using Angus, Hereford, Simmental size, but we've also, um, we're also as far as uh, 11 breeds in the most recent cohort. And that's across 3,000 females um, by synchrony, uh, fixed time AI programs. Uh, 1,500 of those cows are dairy cows and the other 1,500 uh, beef cows in this last um, cohort. So we get to test a big range of bulls, a big range of breeds, and really see how the tools that we've got are able to um, deliver. And we're doing this on a range of farms, and this is the really important part, is that there's lots of different environments in New Zealand, just as there is in every other uh, country. And in the UK, we've been able to see a big range of environments in the last week, um, which has really been really interesting. But um, you know, in, in the north, most um, yellow star we've got there, Fongarau Farms, you know, they're a big, extensive, uh, dry, um, dry summer East Coast farm, um, and they have uh, mild winters. And a, with a property that has 2,500 cows, um, it's it's extensive, but it's a, a a real test of cattle. Are some of our lightest cattle because the mobs are large, the stocking rates high, and a real chance to um, to, to put pressure on, on animals. Um, you know, a real range. We've got Rangitike Station, that uh, number two property, which is in the central North Island. They have a 150-day winter. Cows lose as much as 150 kilos over the winter, and they come out of the spring, come into mating mud fat, and they're very late calving, and we get a great chance to see um, how cattle do in that situation. It's the farm's dead flat, uh, and it's pumice country, so it's sort of soil that you could um, pour water through, and it, and it runs and runs out like a sieve. And I've right down to like a property number five, which is Cabafay. Uh, Cabafay station is uh, has got irrigated land, 
and it really allows us to, on a grass-based system, approach these cattle and kill them early. Um, and so he's, there's never a, a shortage of grass. And of course, Warwickia State, which is our dairy farm, and just a real chance to look at how bulls are going in lots of different environments. We spread the use of those bulls throughout the different environments and see how those tools are sticking out. So what we do, um, if we start with the dairy beef situation, uh, we tag those calves at birth. We take a DNA sample from those calves, um, which we got, uh, later on use to um, assess their um, ability to pass on uh, their merit uh, via their genes through a technology called genomics. But we, at that stage, we say, okay, look, this is when the calves are born. We've got a date of conception on them on them because we fetal age scan their mothers and we can look at gestation length. We weigh the calves and we record their calving ease. Now, on the beef cows, we don't have look at so much detail um, in the birth situation, but we do um, go really hard in everything else. So we um, we follow through for, we weigh those calves regularly. Um, when they come up to 80 months of age, we structurally assess those animals. Um, we scan them using ultrasound scanning um, for uh, things like back fat and rump fat um, for uh, eye muscle area and marbling. And that's a live indicator of um, eating quality. We use that and then we process the steers. We slaughter those steers um, and we take as many as eight measurements in the meat plant. Um, and uh, when those cattle have been slaughtered, they're hung up and chill are assessed. So uh, we, we take out the, um, um, open up the carcass at the 13th, the 12th and 13th rib site and assess that, um, that carcass for anything um, from meat colour and fat colour to things like ossification, um, uh, marbling and the like. We take a heap of measurements at that stage. And then with the heifers, um, the heifers that are replacements, so the maternally side, we'll um, follow those through. We scan their ovaries um, and to see if they're pubescent, if they're showing a corpus of 10 before we put the bull out. Uh, we also at the same time collect the information on the Um, antral follicle count, so the Sorry everybody, I think Max is having some technical difficulties. Just bear with me. They heard um, because they have um, uh, you know, because they're skinny or they're not getting in calf and all these different things um, influence stayability. So why are they staying in the herd? Is it because they're there for a long time or because they're there for a good time? Um, and so all of these different measurements we collect to test the performance of these bulls in these different environments. And, you know, so, so with the beef protein test aside, it's really important to consider what you want to achieve on your farm and we've had a great week um, going around these um, different talks, talking to people from different parts um, of, of the UK and really seeing what drives their businesses, what drives profitability on their farms. And so um, if, you, if you have the time, consider like what's making money in your business, what's costing you money, um, where are the bits um, in your um, suckler care operation that you could improve and then consider some of the breeding values that might match up and actually drive home the genetic improvement components so you can make more money. And we're doing this, we've done this during the week by breaking out, you know, what drives value on the kill sheet, um, how we can improve our cattle after weaning, and then how we can really improve that cow. And all of these things are only as good as the improvement you can make. Um, so consider where you could or should be best to make um, an improvement. And it comes down to a really basic equation that um, that I think probably drives value in, in any suckler herd in any place in the world. And that is the more calves you can have um, times by how heavy or how much weight in those calves you've got to sell by the cents per kilo. So how can we make our, our calves more valuable? How can we have more of them? And how can we get them there quickly? Um, and of course, all of that is, is only as good as the uh, cost of input. And we always take the cost of the input out. So we need to make these cattle cheap to run and we need to maximise the top line in order to be profitable in a suckler, suckler herd. But um, 
um, you know, we, we, we need to match up that bull. And the bull represents 80% of the potential genetic gain in your herd. So you can do so much more on a genetics front by selecting the right bull than you can by um, by selecting your heifers every year that, that replace or culling cows. The bull is the most important part in the genetic, in gen, in the genetic gain um, um, part of your herd. So um, we've got this idea that um, people say, look, I've, I'm a, I use limousines and it's all about getting a good limousine bull. Um, I use simmentails. Um, or I, I use um, Belgian blues or, or British blues. The most important thing is that cattle are very different, and um, we've got a heap of different bulls here, and they all look quite different, you know, from the blue bull at the top down to our Texas Longhorn at, at the bottom right-hand corner, even um, the Spos Indicus bull, the Brahmin, at, at the top. You know, he's got loose skin, um, a, a, a large pizzle, floppy ears, and um, skin like a like a roll at uh, rolly toilet paper dog you know these cattle are all very different from each other and interestingly enough these bulls are as different from each other as these bulls are which are all angus so um you know these are these are real opportunity to find the bull for your operation f find the right pick and um and you know we need to consider that you're not just buying an angus bull you're buying um you're buying the best bull and uh, for, for, for your requirements. And there are so many different types. Um, so um, there is as much variation within a breed as there is between breeds. And there's lots of things that influence the way the bull performs. So we've got a, we've got a, a horn here for bull here. And you know, when you consider that there's lots of different things outside of his genetics that have influenced the way he, he looks, he walks around, he moves. And so the more things that, um, um, that affect him, that we need to take into account um, so that we can really work out what is what it in fact is genetic. So all of things like these, you know, um, if he's out of a heifer, he's got looks we expect him to be less have had less milk, so he's going to be smaller. If he's a if he's a twin, well, you know, um, he's not going to have as a greater chance. If we forgot to drench him today, or if he's fed differently in this paddock to a bull in another paddock, you know, that is going to influence the way um, that bull looks. And so if we don't take into account all of these things that make animals different, then we're really just guessing at what their performance is going to be to pass on to their calves. And this this is a context. We've got two fellas here, uh, Brian at 800 kilos and Richard at 880. And they're sound, they're, um, they're handy looking bulls, they fit our requirement for type. Um, and they're at a multi-vendor sale, say something like Carlisle. Right now you've got, that's all the information you have and you need to choose which bull. Well, that's that's quite difficult. And if I was to give you more information, to say, look, Brian's in fact out of the heifer, he's been on forage only, um, whereas Richard's out of a mix, mixed age cow and he's had some hard feed at some stage. You know, even with that amount of information, we're able to, to maybe maybe adjust in our heads why we might choose Richard over Brian or Brian over Richard, but really there simply isn't enough information. And if we don't take into account all the things that makes bull, make bulls different, then we can't really tell what's going to be passed on to their calves. And, um, you know, all of this, these ideas are um, underpinned by this BLUP technology. You, know, you, don't, you don't have to know what that, um, that um, those letters mean, but you have to know what they stand for. And, um, and, and that is the best prediction we can, we can make of this animal as a parent, as a sire. And it, interestingly enough, the same technology is used in salmon, in pine trees, in seeds, the same technology is used in dairy cows and grass and goats, water buffalo, sheep, corn, anything. And if this technology didn't work, didn't work the world over, it would have to be the world's biggest conspiracy because there's millions and millions of dollars invested in blood technology throughout the world. It's the same stuff that we use for cattle. And it's the same stuff that they use. So we have to, we have to wonder, could it be a conspiracy? Could this stuff not work? An EBV, very easily, it's an estimated breeding value. It's a number that represents the animal's merit as a parent. So it's what we're going to pass on to our calves. And that's the bit we, we, we're keen on, what they're going to pass on. So when we see a bull and he's got a lean EBV, but the bull himself, uh, lean EBV for fat, but in fact the bull himself is very fat and very thick, we've got to remember that this number represents what that bull's going to pass on to his calves. And that EBV takes into account all the information possible. It adjusts for all the things that make them different and gives you the best estimate of that animal's appearance. It takes into account 
the Bulls family and how all of his family have performed, his own performance, it gives you the best estimate. And of course, if he has any calves that will be contributing, or if we have some information from his genes, from genomics, well, that'll be um, contributing as well. In the UK, you know, there's not a lot of cattle that have got genomic tests that's improving with different breeds, and that's really cool. Um, and but typically, you won't expect two-year-old bulls to have calves yet. So we're relying on the on the top two. They're reported in actual units, so that helps. That makes sense. And again, it's describing the genetics independent of the environment. At this stage, um, most breeding those only allow you to to compare with thin breeds rather than rather than between breeds, um, as we can see with the pre-planned breeding those, which represent a big part of um, of the industry over here. Um, but uh, there are other options like the new um, AHDB multi-breed carcass breeding those that, that do compare across breeds that um, uh, will only let you compare within uh, the continental group or the native group uh, of uh, between them, but they are really useful in um, breeding those derived from the BCMS data. But breeding values are produced. Right, so the beef progeny test, how can we guarantee that tools like breeding values I've just described, that they actually work? And we have to work through this scenario, um, what we expect to see versus what we got. And um, I'm going to put a bit of a scenario up here, and uh, hopefully you'll be able to follow me as I go. So we've got bull two there. He's got an EBV of 40, bull one at 20, bull three at 60. So although there is 20 kilos difference between each of those bulls, um, the sire only represents 50% of the genes in the calf. Um, and thereabouts, but we'll, we'll leave it with 50%. So the sire only represents half. So the difference in actual calf weight is in fact 10 kilos. Half of the benefit is passed on from the sire to his calves. You're buying a bull, you're using them across your cows. So half the genes are from the sire, 10 kilos um, lighter will be bull one, and 10 kilos heavier will be bull three. And if we just randomly slap on some calf weights, and these are pretty average New Zealand calf weights, the sort of weights that we uh, wean our calves at, probably very different to yours, as I've learned. Um, bull two is in the middle at 235, 10 kilos lighter, bull one, 10 kilos uh, heavier, bull three. Okay, now what we're going to do is we're going to put those bulls with your EBVs matched up to their average calf weight, and we're going to uh, line those up on a graph. So there we go, each one of those blue dots, they represent a bull, as EBV matched up to his average uh, of his calves. And there you can see um, that dot in the middle there. You can see his EBV of 40 down the bottom, um, a relative to his calf weight of uh, 235, and so on for the other bulls. And of course, you know, there's always a spread of calves. Uh, the average uh, is um, doesn't represent the range. So we've put up some, um, you know, a, a range of, of weights to each one of those dots representing a bull's calves. The important thing to remember is that this line um, is, is the way we can match up our expected to our um, actual calf weights. So that, that line of 0 0.5, that's saying for every kilo we lift, we expect half a kilo in actual calf weight. Rightio, so look at that line of 0 0.5, that's what we expect the line to be. Now we're going to line up and show you what we actually saw on size um, EBVs relative to their calf weights across all, of, all five of the farms in the first year. So there we go. We're hoping for a slope of 0 0.5. We've got a slope of 0 0.495. Unfortunately, we missed out in the mouthful, but pretty much for 200 day weight for how well those that bull's calves wean, our actual was just about our expected uh, um, and very close to what we hoped. And then we look at 400 day weight, Shit, we're not too bad again. 410 grams was a reliant slope of 0 0.4, pretty good. And then if we go back out all the way out to our um, 18 month weight, our EBV for 600 days, a slope is 0 0.45. We're getting really close what we expected to what we actually saw across those properties. So that's pretty cool. And um, look he, here again, here's in, um, in the number term. So if we matched up what our bull we expected to what we actually got, turned out 90% of the size EBV turned to actual calf weight. So we found that pretty convincing. And across all of the EBVs, all 18 traits that we that we were able to look at, 73% um, of the size EBVs turned to actual calf performance. So we were pretty convinced that these EBVs, well, they're actually working. 
And then now the question is, how do we go about and use them? And the important thing is to remember is that, you know, we'd, we're able to do this on five commercial farms in New Zealand with a range of environments. On that year, we mated 2,400 cows by AI. We used five breeds. We used bulls that had low accuracy, young bulls, and we used old bulls. Um, so anything that could be tested, any way to put pressure on whether or not those breeding values were performing in New Zealand, well, we did it. And, um, and that was our result. So that was really encouraging. I just want to show you, uh, introduce to you a, a few of our beef progeny test farmers. On the left hand side, we have their uh, Simon Lee from Mendip Hills. So he, he's got 1,100 cow herd, um, Hereford cow herd in North Canterbury, a, a, a steep farm at the back. And, um, you know, he he's sort of changed how he's operating as a result of, of what the information that's come out. There we go, that's James um, Van Behamen in the middle, he's from Rangitike Station, the farm that looks a wee bit like the moon in the winter with the um, soil like, like a sieve. Um, he's just a stock manager on that farm. He's the uh, um, same age as me. And this guy, he's um, just a stock manager, but he's managing uh, a farm of uh, 20,000 ewes and um, over 2,000 cows. Um, and his uh, the the way he's operating has changed as well. This information is is changing the way he's farming. We've got Richard Schofield at the right, which is from Fongarau Farms. I introduced you to, to you before. Um, Richard is dead keen on breeding values now, and it's one of his um, number one selection criteria is how well are these cattle going to perform. And so um, so he's changed the way he's operating as well. I think um, you know we've found that that the farmers are the best storytellers. And so if we're producing new information and we've got things we want to talk about, we think it's, you know, it's worth, worth telling, then these guys are our champions. And they've done, they've done a great job of, 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 of talking about what we're doing. But we found that, um, you know, you, um, underpinning these breeding values is good measurement. And we've had to put the recording back in the hands of our breeders and to make sure that, you know, we really can keep driving home good genetic gain into the future. We found that it's just some people like fertilizer, some like cropping and um, some like cows and we hope you're the ones that like cows and and the question is how do you inspire them to be inject objective to want to improve their cow herds to make more gain and we found that um, you know without subsidies in our situation without support um, if you make it competitive and and put these guys in a group and, and play them off against each other so they do want to improve that's a real help and you're able to benchmark and compare between those farms how well they're going they really enjoy that, um, but most importantly, put in dollar terms because at the end of the day, we're here to make money. We're here to be profitable, and, um, and we felt like this has given these guys the mandate to measure. A little example here is um, some kills in our um, beef progeny test from different farms. So each one of those boxes is a different farm. Each one of those coloured bars represents a different kill, and um, across every site, there was a, a vast improvement between um, um, between their kills and successive kills. And so this percentage is talking about um, how well they achieved the beef EQ hit rate. So this is including all of the eating quality measurements. This is including all of the um, different uh, things that underpin good eating and, and, and beef cattle. And it's, um, it's showing that the percentage of those animals that achieve the criteria. And so to begin with, um, and you know, we had quite moderate kills uh, apart from Cabafe. And then uh, by the end of it, every farm had had, had significantly improved their um, their hit rate. So we made that competitive and they really changed. You know, I think around 30% is the national average for the um, number of cattle hitting the um, the BFQ, Silverfern Farms BFQ um, program. And, and you know, this, these farms doing up to 95%. Um, you know, so we're really, they're really doing a great job of, of doing that. And because we're able to benchmark it, a benchmark between them, We've made it competitive. These guys have really changed their their behaviour, and that's cool. And we we thought, well, we slap slap some money on it, put some value to it. That's a bit they're keen on, and that's a bit that's, that 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 drives their their suckler operations. And you know, and that um, if we converted that to value, just by choosing heavier calves, there's as much as 102 pounds um, benefit from just choosing the bulls with better EBVs. And if you want it, well, it's there just by choosing those improved bulls. In I put up this picture of um, uh, Roger Douglas and, and, and David Longy, probably not people that uh, you've ever seen, but these are the guys that overnight dropped subsidies 
um, off the table for New Zealand farmers in the early 80s. They said, look, we're not going to support you anymore. And that had some major consequences. And um, some of those um, effects are still being felt today. But as a result, um, you know, the New Zealand industry is, um, beef industry is better for it. We've come out more resilient, we're more profitable, and um, that 102 pounds a calf, well, you know, we want that because that's how we have to um, operate in order to survive. And it's, um, it's an interesting idea in, a, in the situation, um, you know, in the context of what you guys are dealing with um, or looking forward to dealing with in the UK. Question is, have we made an impact? Well, we've seen some um, a change in bull sale results. Um, and, you know, we've seen uh, genetic improvements, so people changing um, the way they're sitting their cattle. And, but there is a risk of, of dividing um, of dividing people, and it's always important to uh, make sure that we um, give them the right information and make, make, make the best decisions, but keep them on board because, you know, we want to be an industry that supports each other. And um, that's always the risk when you have division. I mean, I just want to put together another little a little context. So these two bulls, and you know, um, in that first year, we we did as much. You we know, really were able to use some bulls with really strong EBVs and and not so great EBVs. And on the example of um, of 400 day weights, so the weight of the calves at yearlings as yearlings or um, uh, bulling heifers um, has been the um, uh, an, 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 a word I've I've heard used. Uh, to describe them, and we had a real range. And so, if we use this percentile bands table, you know, the um, uh, top lad there, at, he's in the top one percent with the breeding value, you know, of above 102. And then our uh, our bull down here, um, powerhouse, at, at, at the top 90 percent. So that shows the big, the full range of the breed. And this percentile bands table is a great way um, to to um, see if a breeding value is good or not so good. So we put it into context to say, well, actually, how much better were top lads calves at 400 days? Well, they had they were 30.5 kilos heavier, um, and you know that's 64 pounds per head, so per calf. And over the year, have a bull having 40 calves, well, you know he would be 2,500 pounds better per year. And if we use them for three years, 7,600 pounds better over its lifetime. So you know there's a real opportunity to grab to grab that value just by choosing better bulls. Um, and just want to draw your attention to this, um, these percentile bands driven EBV bar graphs. Don't worry about the numbers. If you can use this, this makes things so much simpler. Um, you know, where the end of those coloured bars hits, um, draw your eye down to the bottom, it'll tell you the percentile band that that bar or that trait is in, and these traits are grouped in in, in their colours. So the yellow bars are the calving east traits, um, the green bars are the growth, and if they are facing towards the right, they're more preferable, and they're facing towards the left, they're less preferable. And that middle line is our average. So anything above average will go towards the right, and everything below will go towards the left. So quite quickly we can say, look, this sire here, by his yellow yellow bars, he's harder calving, but he's got outstanding growth. And, um, and you know, just by using that alone, that, that picture, we can look at any breed, we don't have to know the breeding values, and we can quite quickly say, look, this is what we're after. And so if you go back to the idea of establishing a genetic plan, determining what your objective objectives are by the things that are making you money, the things that are costing you money in your business, the things that you might want to improve, or maybe just hold where they are because you feel like you're doing a great job of them, well, um, this is the next step. This is identifying which those traits are, and then putting into context by finding that right bull. So do a genetic plan and put it into use. Um, I'd just like to thank um, the AHDB uh, for bringing me over here and the British Cattle Breeders Conference for having me as well earlier in the week. I've um, really enjoyed my time and getting to learn about um, the cattle over here and um, and you know, also being able to share what we've been doing and, and how that might be um, usable and how you might be able to apply it. Um, and also just to all my... Um, uh, progeny test sites and and farmers for all the work they do. You know we um, we enjoy working with them and of course the people that help sponsor the program. So thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much, Max. 
Um, just before we go on to questions, um, Max very briefly touched on the AHDB National Genetic Evaluation Carcass Traits. Max, will you just talk to you? That's it, brilliant, thank you. Just to um, explain these a little bit more before we go on to questions. So um, the EBVs that we're all used to using come from pedigree performance recording data. Um, these new EBVs actually come from BCMS data, abattoir kill sheets, and then we fill in the gaps with the pedigree performance recording. So these are made um, using commercial data from commercial animals. Um, and they're directly linked to the things that beef producers get paid for, so the Europe grid. So we've got five new EBVs, you can see them on the screen. Carcass weight, carcass confirmation, which is the Europe grid, carcass fat class, which is also the Europe grid, carcass weight, and average daily carcass gain. Um, so these are set across two bases, as Max said, so a continental base and a native base. So you could compare an Aberdeen Angus to a Hereford or a, um, a Charolais to a Blue, but you couldn't compare across those bases. But um, until now, we've not had the ability to compare at all. So that's that's a brand new thing as well. Um, so you can find more information. We've got an information leaflet on the uh, Beef and Lamb website under the Better Returns breeding section if you want to find out any more information from those. Um, there is a separate website that you can put um, your bull ear tag numbers into, and if you've been caught recording sires for a long time, um, they should come up. Or equally, you can access these, these. Say you were looking at a bull through the Breed Society website. There's now links down the left-hand side that should say um, AHDB National Genetic Evaluation, and it will take you through to those. Can we just go to the next slide, Max, please? He's not listening. That's it's no longer helping me. <laughs> no, is it not working? There we go. Oh, brilliant. Perfect. That's great. So um, my one plea to you guys is these um, EBVs can only be generated if we have the sires registered on the passports of the calf. Currently, we're only at 23% of sires recorded on BCMS, which is um, a, a, an astonishingly low figure. Um, so please, 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 if you know the, um, the sire of a calf, please register it when you record when you register them with BCMS, um, because without that information, we just have to throw that data away. It's completely useless. So it's it's relevant to dairy bred calves as well as suckler bred. Um, obviously, there's situations where you might not know the sire, but if you do know them, please put it in there. The ear tag's fine. Um, if you type it in once correctly, then it should just come up again the next time in like a drop down box. So you only need to do it correctly once. Um, so, yes, yeah, that is my plea to you. If you want to get involved with the campaign, we're running a social media campaign at the moment. If you've been doing this or you, uh, for a long time or you want to get involved, the hashtag is hashtag shout about the sire. Um, please support us with that. Right, we'll take some questions. Um, oh, my word, there's a lot. Okay, hang on. Bear with me. Right, so first question, Max. Will continual selection of high carbonies affect carcass quality and weight over so many generations? Has Max gone again? Sorry, everybody, please bear with us whilst we get hold of Max. Right, we're back. I'm with Max. So, first question, Max. Will continual selection of high carbon ease, uh, yeah, high ca yeah, will continual selection of high carbon ease affect carcass quality and weight over so many generations? Um, <clears throat> yes, so um, I'll just talk to uh, carcass weight first. Um, you know, there's a relationship between um, uh, genetic correlation between birth weight, uh, growth, mature weight, and carcass weight. Um, so as you lift your birth weight, um, so too does your uh, does your growth, and so so too does the weight of your cows and, and how many um, kilos of, of carcass weight that you might um, might kill. So there's an inherent relationship there. 
and um, and that just happens as we see it. You know, we pick the bigger cattle, and the calves are born heavier, and therefore so are our cows and, and our carcasses become heavier. But unless we break the relationship and use breeding values, um, that's not, it's not possible to have calves that are born lighter and and grow and and also grow fast. Um, so um, so to break that relationship, we have to have breeding values. And so if we look at you know saying will calving ease ruin our carcass weight? Well, yep, most likely. Um, but you have to increase your growth at the same time and look to increase your carcass weight at the same time in order to maintain um, maintain the good production value um, by re by um, increasing the ease of calving. On the carcass quality front, my understanding there is no relationship with um, with marbling. Um, or uh, eye muscle area, um, so we just need to make sure that we keep lifting our breeding values for, for all the things that, um, that are important and drive value for us. Okay, just want to double check, Katie and Chloe, can everybody hear now? Yeah, we can hear, thanks. Brilliant, okay, that's fine. Um, so, EBV is hugely useful, but how important are breeding indexes on keeping breeding decisions going in the right direction? It seems very easy to select too far in one direction sometimes without the balance of an index to support the EBVs themselves. Yeah, cool. So, I mean, do dollar indexes are always the most preferred choice um, because they will um, help us balance up uh, the you know the, the the various figures and I didn't talk about indexes um, in my talk, but it is the it is the best way to make the most profitable profitable decision. Um, that obviously is really important by um, feeding good market information into it and uh, regularly updating them so um, the indexes so they do represent the the right direction uh, for where the market is and how it's changing. Um, but if we can um, if we can use dollar indexes, it will take and make. Uh, help us balance up all the combination of those traits. The risk is that we can have two bulls at the same dollar index. They might be very different, uh, and they got there from um, from having a different combination. But that does help us ensure we get good variation and um, good diversity um, um, with the same um, same index. Okay, next question. Um, how do oh, we've been asked this a lot? How do EBV figures compensate for different feeding regimes? Yeah, and so that, that's that's a, that's the beauty of figures is that we're able to do that. Um, it requires linkage, so having um, common size of bulls we know um, things about, having common size between environments. And so if um, so if we assume that um, all feeding uh, within one herd is the same, and we can only do that by having good information. So if you've um, pulled a few bulls off to go to Carlisle, well, and those bulls are fed. Uh, really well um, and differently to the rest of the bulls and which are fed say just on grass, uh, on forage out in the paddock, um, well we would need to identify those two groups as being different uh, so the evaluation knows that they can't be directly compared. Um, in the herd situation, so we assume that you've done that, you've um, separated those groups out, so therefore all um, animals have been given equal opportunity Providing we've adjusted for those different bulls within the within that herd, we've got a bull that have that has calves in um, this one herd. He's also got calves in another herd that's been fed entirely differently um, um, to our first herd. Um, but because we have um, that sire across both herds, we've got benchmark calves that we can compare how all the other calves are between those two herds. And a really re good genetic evaluation, good breeding those rely on good linkage, but also. Good um, contemporary grouping, and that's all down to the breeder. Okay, great. Um, what percentage of New Zealand beef farmers are making decisions based on figures? Uh, yeah, that's that, that's a hard one. And you know, looking across the world, I think we're probably pretty similar to uh, to, to other groups. Um, but uh, you know, other other breeds and other countries. Um, but um, ultimately, we've we've seen a we've seen a change. Um, and but there is, uh, I said before, there's a risk of division, and so we do have groups uh, uh, that don't believe in the breeding values, um, it, even if we are putting out really good information to say that they are working. But their belief is that maybe you know they're changing cattle in a direction that's not desirable, and so that's why good indexes are really important, and um, and having good descriptors, a, a good a good EBVs that describe what we're actually wanting to improve. Um, but you know, I'd, I'd say we've got a good, a good ma um, majority uh, portion of breeders that are using figures for um, decisions. How can these New Zealand techniques be used in Britain? Is it simply taking into account the EBVs? Yep, I think so. Um, using them, 
using them to pick the right balls because the ball makes is responsible for 80% of the genetic game in your herd. Um, how would you convince more people to perform into card? What would you say is the single most important factor? Um, yeah, so the way that we've had success is by making it competitive, so having these groups um, uh, that uh, that compare to each other, make it competitive, so they don't want to lose. They want to have the best performance. They want to kill, have the best beef EQ hit rates, the best in calf rates. Um, we like to put it in dollar terms, and people like it in New Zealand. We put it to dollar terms, um, but, we, but we also make sure that it's the farmers that are, um, the bit that the case shows is the farmers telling the other farmers how they're going, and, and so they really are our champions. Um, and so they've, you know, it's, it's through that that we're giving them the mandate to measure, the put, pushing the recording back in the hands of the breeders. Um, but if there's a genuine um, push pull with a commercial farmer where you guys, you commercial sucklers, um, suckler, suckler herds are saying, look, you know, we want this, um, then, uh, then then they will in, in time change. And I think that's only uh, the most important thing you can do is by choosing the right breeder. And the breeder is the most important thing. So if you can if you can say, look, say to them, you know, we, we want you to be five-star recording, we want you to be using DNA technology, and we want to see that you are doing this and you can prove it to us. Um, then hopefully those breeders um, are there and they can they can find them. And so if you're choosing the right breeder, you're making most of the time those bulls will be um, the right option for you. So push pull, um, ask your breeders. Do you think enough emphasis is put on the genetic potential of the dams? Um, on the genetic potential of the dams. So um, is this in the beef progeny test context or is it in the stud context? James, is it is it in the progeny testing or general context? I think he means general context. I, I don't think there is enough um, em emphasis based on on, on cows, um, but um, you know that relies on having good descriptors. So um, I noticed that the breed pen EBVs in the UK there is no days to calving. Uh, days to calving is the sounds like calving is, but it's actually talking about fertility. It's saying those females are getting calf early in the breeding season and do it year after year. Well, they're the most fertile, they're the most productive over their lifetimes, and they're the sort of cows we want. Um, but but the more EBVs we can have to describe the cows, the better, because at the moment we don't really have the tools to say, look, um, this cow is, is, is more preferable. We've got things like mature cow weight and calving ease and milk, and they're all really relevant. But if we talk about fertility, which is the number one, which is driving more calves, I think I put up that equation that said more calves times by the amount of kilos times by the, you know, the value of the cents per kilo um, and pulling away your cost of input. The more calves you have is the biggest way you can drive profit in the cycle herd. So um, fertility, um, you know, that's a, a real option. And the emphasis on, on improving the cow, I think that's got, um, that's got a, a long way to go in terms of genetics here. Okay, I think this one's referring to the new carcass EBVs. What's the difference between the two new carcass weights EBVs. So your average daily carcass gain um, is predicting lifetime daily carcass gain, and then your carcass weight EBV is predicting carcass weight at a given slaughter age. So they're both in kilograms, just slightly different. As I said, there's an information leaflet on the um, BRP website if you want to go and have a bit of more of a read about them. Um, right, we've got time for another couple of questions. If anybody's got some, just whilst you're thinking, um, I just want to draw your attention to some resources that are on our website. So Max has been talking about um generating a genetic plan we've now got a suckler breeding plan on the website that you can order it's nothing fancy it's basically just a visual tool to go on your office wall um just so that you can think about what you really want to achieve with your herd and which ebbs you need to focus on um and we've also got our brp uh, brp resources um relating to breeding okay another couple of questions does the optimum cow size vary depending on the environment it is operating in if so by how much yeah, this is a really interesting question, and it's actually one that's come up a couple of times this week. Um, you know, so so cow size is really um, uh, it's the it's the main way that we determine the maintenance energy requirement um, of 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 the animal. So the her weight uh, uh, tells us how much it costs to maintain her. So um, we want easy keeping cows, and so if it's um, we're, if we're in high country. Uh, and, and there's limited feed, or the cow has to walk a long way and, and, and forage, and it's um, you know um, she's having to walk. Well, um, that cow size uh, is is more important than if she's got 
uh, ag lib, as much feed as she could possibly eat in a lowland situation. Um, but just as you know, how much she milks affects her maintenance energy requirement. Um, you know how fat she is. Um, so, so you know, uh, uh, optimum cow size is, is a real. It's a hard question to to answer. Uh, to say, look, this cow is the right is the right size because it also it's also important that she produces a really marketable calf. And typically, smaller cows produce smaller smaller calves. Um, but you know, in turn, they potentially may have earlier turn off times and things like that. And so, maturity could be could be a part of it. Um, but optimal cow size is, dif is difficult. In New Zealand, I think it would be fair to say we you know we're targeting um, a 600 kilo cow or lighter um, in most environments. But we want her to be turning off as much of her body weight in calf as she can at um, at 200 days. So you know, um, preferably 50 percent. But that's um, but that is difficult and obviously limited um, um, by feed. So I hope I've answered that in a roundabout, roundabout way. Um, are such cow farmers in New Zealand selecting heifers from maternal bulls or using more general purpose bulls? Um, I, I think um, typically it's been more maternal. I think there's a quite a big, uh, there's a bigger difference between what we call maternal and probably what the UK um, would would call maternal. So we wouldn't be using uh, more of the continental breeds in a maternal cross in really any situation. Um, and so, you know, so um, when we say are we um, are we certainly more for for maternal traits in the heifers? Well, um, p potentially we are, but that's more of a type thing because we haven't got really excellent descriptors of the way um, these cows look, um, you know, how they perform. Um, so, so we are in somewhat lim some way limited. But I'd say, you know, it, it is um, there would be a, a stronger maternal influence in New Zealand um, than um, than in the UK, probably because of our environment. Um, I think. Okay, so you're saving all the controversial questions to last. How, befine, how far behind New Zealand, America and Australia do you think British commercial cattle genetic selection is based on your experience, if at all? Um, well, I've learned a lot in this last week and I probably have a different opinion on it now than I did before. Because if you think about what your breeding objectives are, and, and, and let's say that the first, um, that an important one is the Europe grid, well, you've done a really great job of selecting cattle for that. Um, a really impressive job of, of improving carcass conformation. If you look at other traits, well, maybe um, m maybe there's been less um, emphasis on some of the maternal um, things, so things like calving ease and cow size. Um, but I think that's also a function of your environment as as well. And the most important thing is recording, um, and and recording allows good selection decisions. Um, recording and um, you know underpins breeding values. And um, and I, I would say that on the recording front, there is probably um, there is probably some improvement to be made with the um, um, British cattle um, 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 breeding, uh, but you know overall, I think there's been some really great advancements and things that are important to you. Okay, um, are, unless there's any more coming, we'll make this the last question. But are any breeds making speedier gains than others, which is the which is currently the best? If we had a pound every time somebody asked us that. Um, I'm just going to be a bit of a politician and just sort of weasel my way out of that one. Um, you know, there is um, a, a, a throughout the world, there's um, some breeds that are used more than others, and some some that have um, that have placed more emphasis on on performance. And um, yeah, I think uh, I think I'll leave it at that one. Excellent. Okay, right. I would just like to thank you all for tuning in. Anybody else that wants to, anybody wants to listen to this webinar again, it'll be on the YouTube website within the next week. Um, but I'd just like to thank Max very, very much for speaking to us um, and have a good evening. Thanks for having me, Amy. Cheers.